I invite you to open your Bibles to Mark chapter 15. Singing that song with all of you brought me back to the day, days when I was a brand new Christian. And I used to go to devotional Bible studies with the college students and high schoolers at the church up there in Minnesota. And that was one of the first hymns that I remember learning and uh, considering the words to it that God wants to make me and every one of us a sanctuary where God can dwell in us. He can represent himself through us to a lost world. And when I was a a brand, brand new Christian, I I didn't understand, obviously, all of the implications that if I'm going to be a sanctuary for the Lord, I'm going to be a temple for God, that that means that he wants to put his character within me. My wife and I are in the process of, uh, we're we're having a a house built that we got to design and because we're going to be the ones dwelling in that house, we can say, well, we want, we want the room there, and we want the living room this big, and you know, within budget, obviously. But we can, we can put things where we want them to be. Because the ones that dwell in the house are the ones that dictate what the house will look like. And maybe you bought a house that you didn't design and all that sort of thing. You still get to pick where what goes on the wall and where and so whoever dwells in it starts to characterize what the place is like if we're going to be sanctuaries or we're going to be temples of the lord that means that we're inviting him to look at our life and say that wall shouldn't be there there's a bunch of mold over there i'm not even sure what that is but that's got to go and be burned somewhere he's got the right to call those kinds of shots in our life and when we think about jesus and his sacrifice And he turns around and says that this is the way that you're supposed to live as well. Do you really want to be a sanctuary? Do you really want to be a temple of the Lord? Suffering has for a long time been one of the biggest reasons why people, at least since the Enlightenment, don't believe in God. People will say if there's a good and loving God, why would he allow the evil and suffering in the world? And maybe there's other people that still believe that God is real, but if he would allow these things that have happened in my life to have happened, then I don't know that I ever want to serve him. I don't know if you've ever talked with people before that were frustrated and discouraged by the kind of suffering they have gone through in their life, and there's no soundbite answer that you can give to somebody that's just going to you know, snap a finger, and now they're emotionally okay with everything. But one of the things that the Christian worldview offers people that no other worldview does is that our God left his heavenly abode and became a man and allowed himself to suffer the punishment of a criminal. John chapter 1 verse 11 says, He came to his own and his own did not receive him. The Jewish people were expecting the Messiah to come to destroy the Roman Empire and instead Jesus comes and he starts talking about loving your enemy. And he didn't fit the mold of what they wanted him to be. Which allowed this opportunity for them to go ahead and have him crucified. But allows us the opportunity to know that the one who came for us, who bled and died, is somebody who can sympathize with our weaknesses and sympathize with our sorrows. When people ask the question, where is God in my suffering? The answer of the Christian worldview is he's right beside you because he came into this world and entered into all of it. We're going to read this scene here in Mark chapter 15, verses 16 to 32. This is not where Jesus actually breathes his last, but this is when he goes to the place of the skull and is crucified. And I want us to think about that scene. And before we read this text, do you remember that time in Exodus chapter 3 where God told Moses to remove the sandals from his feet? Whatever the mental equivalent of that is, do that while we read this text. This is the Son of God subjecting himself to something that he could have stopped in the blink of an eye. Look at Mark chapter 15, starting in verse 16. And the soldiers led him away inside the palace, that is, the governor's headquarters, and they called together the whole battalion. And they clothed him in a purple cloak, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on him. 
And they began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews. And they were striking his head with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling down in homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the purple cloak and put his own clothes on him, and they led him out to crucify him. Notice, by the way, that verse 16, the soldiers led him, and then at the end of verse 20, they led him. He's the one allowing himself to be led to these things. Look at verse 21. And they compelled a passerby, Simon of Cyrene, who was coming in from the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to carry his cross. And they brought him to the place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull. They offered him wine mixed with myrrh, but he did not take it. And they crucified him and divided his garments among them, casting lots for them to decide what each should take. And it was the third hour when they crucified him, and the ascription of the charge against him read, The King of the Jews. And with him they crucified two robbers, one on his right and one on his left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down now from the cross. So, so also the chief priests with the scribes mocked him to one another, saying, He saved others, he cannot even save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also reviled him. One of the things that we see in this scene in the crucifixion are a lot of ironic things happening. And by ironic things, I don't mean things that are funny, but there's different kinds of irony. And one kind of irony is something called dramatic irony. And dramatic irony is defined as irony that is inherent in speeches or a situation of a drama and is understood by the audience but not grasped by the characters in the play. In other words, have you ever seen a movie before where you as the one watching the movie, you know what's going on, but the people in the movie don't really understand what's going on, and you're wondering how they're going to react to it and what it, how it's all going to play out. Notice these, there's a couple ways that you could make some statements that just show the ironic things that are happening in this passage, and one of them is that the man, the man that's mocked as king is in fact the king. You see that in verse 18, you see that in verse 32. The Gospel of Mark up to this point has proven that Jesus is the king. Remember, John the Baptist is the guy that's rolling out the red carpet for the ministry of Jesus. And then when Jesus is baptized in Mark chapter 1, that's like his coronation, where the, where the Father is speaking from heaven, this is my, my son, this is the one that I'm pleased with, designating him to be the king. He goes out and fights the enemy in the next section where he's defeating Satan with the temptations and he's not succumbing to the temptations. Every king has got a manifesto. And Jesus' manifesto is everybody should repent because the kingdom is at hand. And so on and on, the Gospel of Mark has shown us in so many different ways that he is indeed the king, but these people who are mocking him in this way don't realize that he is actually the king. You know what this shows me about being a sanctuary or a temple for the Lord? Is that if I'm going to try to mimic and, and imitate Jesus, that it means that I'm going to be mocked in ironic ways too. The world will say things to us like, you're the bigot, you're the one that's unloving, and it's the exact opposite that's true. The man that's mocked as king is, in fact, the king. Notice another one, though. The powerless man is powerful. Throughout this text, we already pointed out in the reading that he was led different places. He couldn't carry his own cross. In verse 24, his clothes are taken from him. In verse 32, people are calling for him to come down from the cross, but he's not doing it. And so they're saying that this man just doesn't seem to have the kind of power to get down from that cross. But to this point in the Gospel of Mark, the readers know that Jesus is indeed powerful. We talked about how he told Mr. Withered Hand Man to stretch out his hand and Mr. Paralyzed Man to get up and walk and Mrs. Dead Little Girl to get up and walk and, and, and to breathe and all that kind of thing again in Mark chapter 5. So he's, he's obviously powerful, but yet he's being treated in such a way and he's being mocked in such a way that people don't think he actually has power. Remember what Philippians 2.8 says? He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Um, do you know what's going to happen to us sometimes? is that when Jesus teaches us how to be meek, 
how to steward our power. Every one of us in this room has got power. We have power to manipulate people with our anger. We have power to manipulate people with our passive aggressiveness. We've got the ability to divide churches. We've got the, the, the ability to get our way by hook or by crook. Do you know what uh, Christians do, though? Is they take that power that they have, and they don't use it in sinful kinds of ways. Do you think that's going to cause at times the world to look at a Christian and go, you are so weak, when indeed that's the moment you're showing the most strength? Notice another thing. The man who can't save himself saves others. Come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. You, you saved other people. You helped so many other people. But you can't even help yourself on the cross. You know what the ironic thing about that statement is? Is that for Jesus to have ultimately saved people, he had to stay on the cross. And so he couldn't save himself. Remember in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 12, where Paul says, so death is at work in us, but life in you. If you were to be able to interview Jesus while he was on the cross, you're a reporter, and you're writing down your notes, and you could interview Jesus and go, hey, Jesus, uh, do you think this is helping people right now? What would the answer be? Yeah, this is helping people. Okay, all right, so my follow-up question then is, what does it feel like to help people? Does it feel like I'm on top of the world and everything's just going really great for me? Or does sometimes the way that you know you're helping people is when it feels like death for me? If I'm going to transfer life to you, it means I have to put to death my time, my talent, my treasures. I have to use these things for you. Do you know what that feeling is like to help people? And you feel like it's, you just don't see the results that you'd like it to see, you feel like you're losing sleep, you're praying for people. Sometimes to help people, the way that you know it is it feels like death. Now, with these ironic things that are happening in this scene, how could all of this actually be true? I want to draw your attention to just one thing in this text that serves as evidence that this event really happened. Simon of Cyrene is brought up in verse 21. Simon of Cyrene is brought up in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But it's only in Mark's account that we have the names of Simon's children, Alexander and Rufus. Have you ever read different parts of the Gospels and compared the Gospels and realized that, you know, Melchus, the guy that Peter cut his ear off and everything, I think he was going for his whole head, by the way, and the guy just like went like that and just got the ear or something. Why is he only named in the Gospel of John, I think? I think he's only named in John. But, but then in, in Mark here, you have Simon's children named, but they're not named in the other Gospels. Why is that the case? In our culture today, if you want to write an academic book and prove to people that these arguments are true, what you do is you have footnotes. And you cite your sources. And so if anybody wants to fact check you, they can do all of that sort of thing. How would people cite their sources in this time period? If you were to go read other eyewitness accounts of other things that happened in this time period, the way that they would do it in this culture is they would drop names that the audience would know. And so evidently, Matthew's audience and Luke's audience did not know Alexander and Rufus, but in this culture, it would stand to reason that Mark's audience would know Alexander and Rufus. In fact, Mark's gospel is probably written to a Roman audience, and Romans 16, verse 13 says, Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord. Might be the same guy. Can you imagine if it was? And on that Sunday morning when they were all gathered together in the first century, they got the scroll of the gospel of Mark. Somebody gets up, and they read it to everybody. And at, towards the end of the gospel of Mark, Rufus is name dropped in the letter and everybody swings around and they look at at Rufus and after the final prayer they all rush over to Rufus and say hey was it really your dad that carried the cross he says yeah yeah that was him like what what Mark said there is exactly right try to imagine what's happening in this scene at this point Jesus would have been scourged we talked a little bit about that last night which means he would have been tied to a post and whipped with something that the Romans called a cat of nine tails. It was a whip that had chunks of metal and bone in it. And you can imagine all the blood dripping down his back. 
And Jesus is where the the Romans are here, and he's in this governor's headquarters with the whole battalion of the Romans. And in my mind, I've always pictured this scene with like 10 or 12 or 15 Romans, Roman soldiers. But a whole battalion, as this text says, is 200 people. Is it really 200 people that are with Jesus here that begin to mistreat and harass Jesus, and they put a purple cloak on him, like what a king would wear, and they twist together this crown of thorns and they set it on him. Do you remember the first time in the Bible we read about thorns and thistles? It was in Genesis chapter 3 after sin has entered the world. It's as if Jesus is experiencing part of the brunt of the curses right on his head. So they put that on him. They get the, the, the scepter, the reed to act like a scepter. They start striking him on the head. Everything that they're doing to Jesus here is a mocking way of calling him a king. The purple robes, the crown, the scepter. So what's the spitting? Why is it that you have up to 200 people drenching Jesus with spit? How were kings anointed back then? By pouring oil on their head. I wonder if part of the spitting is actually part of the, 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 mockingly, uh, the, the way that they're mockingly addressing him as a king. There's your anointing, spit, spit, spit. They tear the cloak off of him, and you can imagine all the blood that would have coagulated on that. 700 years before this event, Isaiah 50, verse 6 says, I gave my back to those who strike and my cheeks to those who pull the beard. I hid not my face from disgrace and spitting. Now, the place of crucifixion was outside the city. And back then, the the vertical beam would have already been at the place of crucifixion. What you would have carried back then would have been the cross beam called the patibulum. And that weighed about 150 pounds, depending on how big it was. And we know from John chapter 19, verse 17, that Jesus went out bearing his own cross to the place of Uh, called the the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Jesus begins carrying it, but you can imagine after all the trials that we talked about yesterday, he's exhausted. You can imagine him stumbling, his back is shredded open, and so they compel Simon of Cyrene to help bear Jesus' cross. And so they eventually get to this place, you can imagine on the way, there's all these people looking at Jesus, looking at him as some kind of evil criminal. We can't believe that you did the things that you did, all this sort of thing. And they get to Golgotha, the place of the skull. Why is this place called the place of the skull? Some people have said, and I've looked up pictures of it, that if you were to look at the place they think he was crucified, the mountain, the hill kind of area looks like a skull, Maybe maybe that's the reason. Maybe this part of the reason was because this was a location where a lot of people were were executed, so maybe there were skulls and bones and all that kind of thing scattered around the area. But maybe there's another ironic reason it might have been called the place of the skull. You remember back in Genesis chapter 3 when God is giving the promises about the man that's going to be born of woman and how he's going to crush the head of the serpent? Whose head was crushed? Whose skull was crushed? in this place. It was Satan's. And perhaps there's an ironic reason why it's named that. Verse 24 just says it very simply without a lot of details, and they crucified him. You can imagine them putting one nail in one wrist, one nail in the other. You can imagine the first the, the first hit on the nail and it, it goes through the skin and they have to do it a couple more times and all the blood that's coming out, they have to lift him up Uh, from the patibulum onto the vertical beam and and get that connected with it and then put his feet in as well, and they crucified him. The original audience would have known what those words meant just from verse 24. Imagine that while he's up there, the one who created everything, the Romans are just acting like, well, this is like a slot machine where look at this guy and look at all the things that he has. We'll go ahead and take whatever we want. Rolling dice, as it were, to get the things that they can get from him. Like Psalm twenty-two, eighteen says, they divide my garments among them and for my clothing they cast lots. The inscription above him, King of the Jews. Now if you step back even further, on his left and on his right, there's a robber on either side. Remember what Isaiah 53, verse 12 said, that he was numbered with the transgressors? That's not true just in his crucifixion, by the way. His whole ministry, 
he was numbered with transgressors. You are with the tax collectors. You're with the sinners. You're amongst those kinds of people. And while Jesus is up on the cross, there's three waves of mocking that happen. The first wave of mocking is just the passerbys. These people that just walk by and they're deriding him. They're saying all kinds of things about how you said you could rebuild the temple in three days. Save yourself. What kind of person do you have to be to see somebody bleeding out and dying and mock them? The second wave of mocking comes from maybe a little bit more unlikely of a place, which is the chief priests and the scribes. Did you notice that the text said in verse 31 that they mocked him to one another? Almost as if they're not even like saying it directly to Jesus, but it's just kind of like banter amongst each other. I don't think that the chief priests and the scribes are the kind of people who would normally just pop some popcorn and go watch a crucifixion. But I think this is a time where they're reveling in their success. The man that they've been jealous of, Mark 15, 10, is finally going to die, and we don't have to put up with this guy anymore. But do you know what's ironic about the chief priests being there? What was one of the roles of the chief priest? Was to oversee the sacrifices. And ironically, here they are, overseeing the sacrifice, not knowing that it's actually the sacrifice of the true Lamb of God. The third wave of mocking comes from the criminals on Jesus' either side. Can you imagine, everybody's looking at him and mocking him. There's just a few women and John that are at the foot of the cross, and they're the faithful ones, but everybody else is just making fun. And even the criminals are looking in at Jesus, and they're about to die. They're about to expire, but they're all looking with their final breaths, making fun of Jesus, except for the one that did repent. We know in Luke 23, verses 42 and 43, uh, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly, I say to you today, you will be with me in paradise. What was the reason that Jesus suffered? Why was Jesus suffering in this scene? I think one of the ways that you could answer that question is to pay attention to what people are saying about him to mock him. Like verse 18, hail king of the Jews. And then in verse 32, mockingly calling him the king of Israel. Kings have ultimate authority and power. Kings can have their, they can say, make a giant pyramid of me so you all remember me and I'll have an afterlife, and it gets made. They can say, get me like that really nice thing to lay on and the big leaf thing that acts as the ancient uh, air conditioning and get me a bowl of grapes and boom, it's done for them. Kings have authority to get whatever they want by their word. By the way, Genesis 1, God says, let there be light. What's one of the points of Genesis 1? God is the cosmic king. His words make things happen. And so Jesus has made claims that show that he's the king. The gospel has been proving that Jesus is the king. But this isn't the kind of king we want. We want one that's a political deliverer. We want one that's going to give us bread all the time. We want a king that's going to meet our desires, which really means that we want to be the king. You know why I think these people are mockingly, habitually calling him king, king, king? It's like they're saying, we're not going to submit to you. You think that you're going to be the one that rules over us? You're not a king. Well, we're going to say that you're a king in a mocking way, saying that we don't want to submit to you. This explains why people have such an emotional reaction today whenever Jesus is brought up in a conversation. You can talk about the weather. You can talk about sports. Maybe not in Alabama, but you can talk about like college football and other places where, um, you know, if your team loses or whatever, you can still, I guess, sort of get along with people. But, um, but if you bring up Jesus in a conversation, suddenly people get awkward and weird. Why does this happen? It's because Jesus inherently demands authority, which means that your job is to submit, and when people don't want to do that, they'll start mocking, just like 2 Peter 3.3 3 says, That scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. You want to know one of the reasons for skepticism? It's because people want to do what they want to do. I'll never forget this time when I was in Minnesota. I had finished up my training program in Nashville. And uh, my wife and I went to Minnesota to do like a three-week vacation just because we were going to go to California And we didn't know how soon we'd be able to go back to Minnesota. So the church there gave me like a three-week vacation to go to Minnesota and to see everybody before we went out to California. And so while I was there, there was one of the guys at the church that wanted to get together with me. 
and he was struggling with some questions. So we got together, and he said, so I've been wondering if the Bible's been tampered with, and if the manuscripts that we have are reliable, and if what the Bible says today, and like, how do we really know that any of this is true? And there is just something about what he was saying that made me feel like there was something else going on. But it was tempting to just say, okay, how about this? I'll give you 5,000 reasons to believe in the Bible. Is that good now? Maybe that would be what he needed, but he needed something different in this situation. So I asked him this question. I said, so I think there's good answers to all of these things that you're asking about, but be honest with me. Is there something that the Bible teaches that you don't like? You know what would have sounded like the intellectual deep conversation is 5,000 reasons to believe in the Bible. Do you know what the deeper conversation was that needed to be had? Was that there was some kind of immorality in his life. And that was driving him to want to have these discussions because I'm not sure I believe it anyways. And by the way, if I don't believe it, that means I can keep doing what I want to do. Do you know why people scoff and mock and ridicule Jesus and the Bible and what we do when we come together is because our example of following Jesus and trying to be concerned with this makes other people feel guilty. Have you ever been at a restaurant before where the first person orders a cheeseburger, the next person orders a Philly cheesesteak, the next person orders a double cheeseburger, and then the next person gets like a quintuple cheeseburger, and then you got the next person that goes, I want a salad, (laughs) because that's how salad eaters talk or something. And everybody swings their chairs and looks at the salad eater, and what do they do? They all start making fun of the salad eater because the salad eater, Mr. Salad Eater person, is making everybody else feel really guilty. Let's say that every year somebody for Christmas got you uh, mints and deodorant. Every year, that was their gift to you, is mints and deodorant, mints and deodorant. You know, the only way that you'd appreciate that gift is if you really acknowledge that you had bad BO and bad breath. There are some gifts that in order for you to receive with gratefulness means that you have to accept that there's something wrong with you. And when we say that we believe in the gospel and this is what we follow, it inherently means that you're all sinners, we're all sinners, and we need Jesus' sacrifice to save us. And so it's a gift, yes, but it's a gift that requires humility to receive. And when we're the ones trying to represent that, and we're the ones trying to teach that to the world, people are going to not like this. I remember one time, my first job at a gun club, I was setting up sporting clays courses, and I was out there with a guy that had just gotten out of rehab, and he was like 19 years old, and we were talking about Jesus and the Bible and Christianity, he wasn't a Christian, and um, he said, you know, I'm just, I'm not sure that I really need the Bible because I think I'm a pretty good person. And he's like, well, what do you think, Eric? And I said, I don't think you're a good person. And I don't think I'm a good person either. When we represent Christ to the world, we're representing that something that says, you've got to submit. You're not the king. Somebody else is the king. And you stand guilty before him. And people say, I don't want the deodorant. I don't want the mints. It's too offensive for me to take that. But when we're the ones standing up for this, the same reproaches that came on Jesus will fall on us as well. Why is it that we suffer? Because we represent the one who has authority. It's not because we're great. But it's because we're trying to tell people about the one who has authority. And if they can say, away with him, away with him, crucify him, it'll make him feel a little bit better for a time. If this is why Jesus is suffering, he's suffering for doing the right thing. If you suffer for doing the wrong thing, you kind of, well, you know, I shoplifted, so it makes sense that this happened to me. You know what's really difficult? is when you're doing the right thing and you suffer for doing the right thing. How did Jesus show his example in the midst of unjust suffering? Go to 1 Peter chapter 2. It's not going to be on the PowerPoint. Have you ever noticed how many passages there are outside of the Gospels that tell us to reflect on Jesus' crucifixion and what we can learn from that? This is one of them. And this was this, one of the scripture readings, I think, on Sunday night. But look at 1 Peter chapter 2, starting in verse 21. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, 
leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Peter's writing this letter to a group of Christians that have been scattered to different places and they're suffering. If you read through 1 Peter, though, you'll see that the kind of suffering that gets emphasized is what people are saying about them and to them. They're speaking against them as evildoers. They're being maligned, all these different sorts of things that are verbal. By the way, when Jesus was crucified, what do the Gospels emphasize the most? His physical pain or what people were saying? What people were saying. And so when Jesus was being mocked, when he was being ridiculed, and yes, going through physical pain as well, how did he conduct himself? Did he spit back at them? Did he have mean, bitter glares at them? Was he praying for them all to be barbecued and fried? Well, what this text says is that he didn't revile in return. There was no deceit found in his mouth. Look at his example in the midst of his suffering which is supposed to be our example as well. Why is Peter saying this in this context? Go back to 1 Peter chapter 2 and look at verse 13 and 14. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to the governor sent by him to punish those who do evil and praise those who do good. All right, I'm not going to ask for a show of hands on this because I already know what the answer would be. How many of you in the last, let's just, Let's just make it a big number. In the last 10 years, have, feel like, have felt like you have suffered because of the government. Everybody, right? And we always handle this really well. You know what Satan's low-hanging fruit is to get you to sin? Is your words. It's like as soon as something bad happens, I'm going to complain about it, and I'm going to have a bad attitude about it, and I'm going to post all kinds of things on social media about it, all this kind of thing. What, what's happening in 1 Peter 2 is you guys have wicked rulers, but you're still supposed to sub be subject to them. You're still supposed to honor them. Yeah, but they're causing me to suffer. And we as Christians always handle this really well on social media, right? We never complain about the government. We never complain about certain politicians. We're just always super, super, duper, duper good about that. Do, do you see the lesson here? When you suffer, you don't threaten back, you don't have deceit, you don't have this ungodly kind of conduct. Well, go down a little bit further in this context. Look at verse 18. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 18. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. How many of you in the last 10 days have suffered because of your boss at work? And then you go to your co-workers, and you say, blah, 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 and all that kind of stuff, you know? And you start to spread all that kind of hate and gossip and slander in the workplace. Do we always handle that? And you see that it's in this context that we're supposed to look at Jesus' example when he's going through unjust suffering and say, that's how I'm supposed to handle it. If you take an orange and squish it, what comes out of it? It's orange juice. If you take a bug and squish it, you get bug guts. If you have a cup and you knock into it, the things that spill out of it are the things that were already there. If you feel like some kind of unjust suffering is, is squeezing you or, or it's causing to, you to be bumped into, whatever comes out of your mouth because of the pressure that you're feeling is not just, oops, it was a moment of weakness. It's showing you what was already there. And those are moments where you get revealed to you, what am I really made of? Jesus is on the cross for, un, for unjust reasons. He's suffering in all kinds of ways, and he's praying for their forgiveness. That's our example. So you see the flow of thought. Why did Jesus suffer? Unjustly. People didn't want to submit to him. We try to represent him to the world. People will mock us and make fun of us as well. This is the example. Now, if we could get into the psychology of Jesus in so much as the scriptures allow us to, what was Jesus thinking that helped him with this? Look at 1 Peter 2.23 again. 
When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. What was Jesus' thinking? He kept entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Okay, well, I thought he's going to be the final judge in Revelation. John seems to indicate that as well, John 5. Well, at the moment he was being crucified, judgment didn't belong to him. And so what he was saying on the cross, I guess, something like, God will judge righteously. There's going to be a final judgment day where it's all going to be settled. It's not my job right now to do this, which means, by the way, if I have anger problems and I'm always being vengeful, it's not, it's not just that, oh, I have an anger problem. I have a faith problem. Because every time I try to punish somebody because they hurt me or get back at somebody because they hurt me, I'm failing to realize that God is going to settle all the accounts one day and it's not my job to deal with this. I don't have the power or the wisdom to know how to judge the right way. One of the things that uh, my wife and I have done from time to time is whenever the kids mistreat one another, they act out or something like that. You know how some people on their, fr- their refrigerators, they have their prayer requests or like, like nice verses and all that kind of thing. So what we have on our fridge is something called storing up wrath. And it's from Romans chapter 2. And what my wife will do whenever one of the kids acts out is sh- there's, you know, Asher, Abigail, Hannah, Elliot. Well, Elliot, maybe, maybe he's one. He- he's getting there. Where if, if, if they act out in some way, she just goes to the fridge and puts a check or a mark on it. And then the kids know that that means when daddy gets home, you're going to get some wrath. And for some of you, it might be three times when he gets home. For some of you, it might be five. Some of you didn't get any. But let's say that Abigail was mistreated by uh, her older brother, Asher. And she's struggling with anger and bitterness. And oh, I can't believe that he took away my toy and all this sort of thing. If she knows that there's wrath coming for him, does that give her the ability to kind of ease up and know that daddy's coming home? And, he, and my job is just to love him because he's going to get what's coming to him. And maybe if I can show him love, maybe his heart will change and then he won't get more wrath coming to him later today. You know what's true for all of us is our father's coming home, which means every wicked politician, means every wicked boss you've ever had, Every person that's ever cut you off, every, everybody that's ever done anything wrong, God is going to settle it in, in his perfect justice and in his perfect ways, and he's cleaning these people up that are trying to serve him, and maybe sometimes it's one another that we get frustrated by. But God's going to settle everything one day. Do you have the faith in his judgment to cause you to ease up on your anger and to ease up on your retaliation? You don't have an anger problem. You have a faith problem. You don't have a vengeful problem. You've got a faith problem if you're a bitter person in that way. Now, the final thing that I want to share in this lesson is if Jesus suffered unjustly, this was his example in it, what else was he thinking beyond the fact that there's going to be a judgment day, which is good news for all of us because it does ease up our need to feel like we need to get our pound of flesh? Are there any other passages in the Bible that teach us what Jesus was thinking when he was on the cross? Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Notice that Jesus endured the cross. What does it mean to endure something? You, you go through the, the difficulty without justifying sin. We'll talk more about that tomorrow with Job. But he despised the shame in this text. Well, you know what it means to despise something? It doesn't mean like an overt hatred. The idea is, is you don't think much about it. It's like water rolling off of a duck's back. It just doesn't affect it very much. You don't, you don't think heavily about it. He despised it. It doesn't, not a big deal, doesn't really hurt me, that sort of thing. How did he do that? Because if somebody looks at me the wrong way or somebody wants to persecute me in some way, oh man, I'm really struggling. I don't despise the the suffering and the, the mistreatment that I experience. How did Jesus do it? Did you notice it in verse two? Who for the joy set before him. What was the joy set before Jesus? Maybe you could say that the joy set before Jesus was like John 17, 
glorify me with the glory that I had before I ever came into this world. When, when Jesus would be reunited back with the Father in the heavenly realm. Do you think that's part of the joy that he's talking about? I think so. But was there anything else that Jesus gained from his suffering and through his suffering that he didn't have prior to his suffering? You know how we're wired for stories about some king coming and rescuing the woman in distress? We're, we're just wired for stories like this Savior coming and swooping in and saving somebody, and he's going at great lengths and great pain to do that sort of thing. What is it that Jesus gained through his suffering he didn't have before? It was his bride. Do you think that Jesus is excited about having a bride, or do you think it's, oh, like, those people, I just, you know, I, I guess there's going to be the, the Bible ends with the marriage supper. I don't know what the Father appointed that day for me. It's, it's an arranged marriage, I guess, and I don't know all this. I don't think that's his attitude. The joy set before him was you, which means that the joy set before us is him. And if the joy set before him was us, and that's what helped him endure the cross, do you think the joy set before us, being with him one day, can help us endure anything that we go through for the Lord? We've got joy in the future. We can rejoice not just in this moment, but we can rejoice in our hope, which will never be taken away from us unless we walk away from it. We always have reason to rejoice because of where we're going one day. And I have to believe that while Jesus was on the cross, he started to get a taste or he started to receive some of that joy. Isn't it ironic that Jesus was crucified between two robbers? You know what the truth is when Jesus was on the cross? There was an unrighteous robber, unrighteous robber, and then Jesus was the righteous robber in the middle. Remember in Mark chapter 3, verse 27? where Jesus compared himself to a robber who went into the strong man's house to bind up the strong man so he could plunder back his goods. You've got unrighteous robber, unrighteous robber, and the righteous robber, who is actually the thief on the cross? Jesus is stealing the thief on the cross. Jesus is the thief on the cross, the righteous one, stealing back what Satan had taken from him, stealing back what always belonged to him to begin with. And the question for us tonight is whether or not Jesus has stolen your heart. Have you beheld what he's done for you? And has it moved your heart in such a way that you could do nothing but serve him for the rest of your life? Look at the great pains. We were the damsel in distress, but we weren't really even a damsel. We were, we were people that were cheating on him, and he still comes to rescue us. Has that caused your heart to be so melted that he can form it and to shape it into whatever he wants? Make me into a sanctuary. Make me into a temple, God. You've proven that you love me. Come into my life and do whatever you want to do. Take away whatever sin needs to be taken away. Restructure me to be exactly what you want me to be. If there's anybody here tonight that needs to dedicate their life to God and let him come in. He's earned all the right to do it. Not only because he's objectively the king, but he's also the one that came and died for you. If there's anything that you need, don't leave here without talking to somebody, or you can come forward while we stand and while we sing.